Craig Larson wrote, Bill Gates, who is the chief executive of Microsoft, is hooked up to the international computer network called the Internet. How many of you are connected to the Internet? It's almost a have-to thing nowadays, isn't it? Subscribers to the Internet can send their, through their computers electronic mail called email. Almost put the post office out of business to other users of the internet. Bill Gates has an internet address just like everyone else. But then the New Yorker magazine published his internet act address. Anyone could send the computer genius a letter. In no time, Bill Gates had, was swamped with 5,000 messages. It was more than any human could handle, so Gates armed himself, armed his computer with software that filters through his email allowing important messages through and sending other letters to electronic oblivion. People are limited. They can only handle so much communication and offer only so much help. God, on the other hand, never tires of S-mail, spirit mail. His ear is always open to our prayers, and he has unlimited capacity to help. The New Life Application New Testament Commentary says, The Christian's most powerful resource is communication with God through prayer. It is the instrument of healing and forgiveness, and is the mighty weapon of spiritual warfare. The results are often greater than we thought were possible. This morning what we're going to do is we're going to take an in-depth look at prayer. We talk about prayer a lot because, like we said, prayer is one of the is the most vital thing that we have in our lives. We like to say that it's one of the weapons that we have, or one of the most important things we have in our lives, but I believe that Scripture tells us that it is not one of the most important things in our life, it is the most important thing that we have in our life because it is our communication with God. And this morning we're going to look at the purpose of prayer, how to prayer, and then we're going to look and an answer to, the, to a prayer that New Testament believers received that they almost missed it. And how sometimes we almost miss it. But prayer is necessary because it has a purpose. And in James chapter 5, verses 15 through 16, we read, it says, And the prayer offered in faith will make a sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If you've sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. So that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The first purpose that I want to talk about this morning with prayer is healing. When someone is sick, James instructs us to pray. You see, when faithful people pray, God moves and the sick are healed. If a person's sickness is a result of their sin, they're forgiven. How many times have we seen over the past several years that prayer is powerful and effective? Mm -hmm. I don't think I can count, even with taking my shoes off, mm -hmm. the number of times that we've prayed for somebody one Sunday morning. And within a week or two, they come back with a praise report of how God answered our prayers. So if we don't believe that prayer works, we're missing out. We're not paying attention to what God's doing through our church. But now remember, it's not our prayers that bring the healing. It's God, but God works through our prayers. Praying for the sick is something that not only James tells us to do, but Jesus tells us to do it. See, prayer is an act of obedience. Prayer shows that we have faith and trust in Christ like we're supposed to. James also tells us that we are to confess our sins to each other. We're to pray for each other. And he's talking about the body of Christ, the church. We're to hold each other accountable. We're to pray for each other. When we do, that will lead others to healing. That will lead each other to forgiveness. That will help us to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But what if prayer isn't for our sickness or 
our sin. Well, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul writes and says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and position, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. See, what Paul is saying here, he says, When trouble comes, don't worry. Pray. God gave us prayer to replace anxiety, to replace worry. Prayer and worry cannot coexist. If you remember not too long ago, I said that we are always remember worry changes nothing, but prayer changes everything. Therefore, when trouble comes, when troubles come along, worry, right? No. <coughs> Go to God with prayer, with petition, with thanksgiving. Giving Him our worries, our troubles, our concerns, our anxieties, our doubts. And obeying what, he write, what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, where he says, Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. See, we should remain joyful. Even during our difficulties. Why do we remain joyful in our difficulties? Because Jesus Christ is right there with us. We're to pray always. We're to always be ready to pray at any given moment. When a need arises. You know, when, when we send out, we get a prayer request. And somebody calls me or texts me and says, hey, I need to pray for such and such, and I send out a text message to everybody. That's a note from God saying, hey, we need you to pray right now. This is where praying always comes in because we have an attitude of prayer. We're ready to pray. And having that attitude of prayer, being ready to pray, will keep us from worrying because when we're praying, we don't have time to worry. See, instead of using prayer as a last resort, prayer should be our first resort. We need to be ready to pray at all times and all circumstances. And at the same time, Paul tells us that we're to be thankful in all circumstances. And that's a little difficult, isn't it? That's a lot more difficult than praying and even being joyful. We have to give thanks. Lord, we're going through a difficult time right now, but thank you. It's really hard to do. But we can do it. Because we can't be joyful and thankful if we're worried. But if we give it to God and we give it to Him, then it is nothing but joy and thanksgiving. But if you have an attitude of prayer, we can do this because we know, we understand, and we trust that God is in control. That God is listening and He's ready to answer our prayers. And if we do this, we are in the will of God. And when we are in the will of God, our prayers are going to be answered. See, God is at work in every situation. Even when we, even when we can't see Him working. And worrying tells Him that we're not sure that he knows what he's doing. It's kind of hard to hear that, but we, when we worry, we tell God, we don't think you have a clue what's going on. But prayer tells him that we trust him no matter what we face, no matter how difficult the situation. Therefore, instead of worrying, we're told to rejoice always, pray continually, be thankful in all circumstances. And it's harder... I know it's, it's easier said than done, right? But like everything, practice makes perfect. Oh, I used to hate that when the band director said that. Practice, practice, practice. Why? Because practice makes perfect. But it works the same way when it comes to rejoicing always, to praying continually, and to giving thanks in all circumstances. Practice makes perfect. That's why when circumstances are overwhelming, pray. When circumstances are impossible, pray. Even when we can't see an end to the circumstances, pray. 
one of the most important purposes of prayer is to help us acknowledge and to remember that we need God. To remind ourselves that we trust God and that we depend on Him to help us through our difficult time. See, it's God's will that we reach out to Him in prayer when we're going in the, through the valleys of life. But He also wants us to reach out to Him in prayer when we're on the mountaintop. And that's where Thanksgiving comes in. See, we, see, we, tend, we tend in our human nature to pray when things get rough. But when God answers those prayers, we're like, thank you, God. And then we go on about our life. We get back on that mountaintop, we're like, well, thank you, God, for getting me here. But then the whole time we're cruising across the top of that mountain, we tend to forget to thank God that we're still on the mountaintop. <clears throat> See, the New Testament gives us many examples of answered prayer, but today I want to take a look at one in particular. In the early years of the church, the Apostle James had just been killed for his faith in Christ. And Peter found himself in prison. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 12, it reads, and So Peter was kept in prison. Well, it doesn't end there, though, does it? There's a big but. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Peter found himself in dire circumstances about to be killed. Peter was about to die for his faith in Christ. The Christians, they could have spent their time worrying. That's a whole lot easier to do, isn't it? But instead of spending their time worrying, they prayed for Peter's release from prison. They did this as individuals and as a group. Now we're going to look at the answer here in a little bit and see how did God did that. But first we need to talk about how to pray. And starting in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Jesus says, But when you pray, go into your room. Close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus says we must pray in private. And we should pray in private more than we pray in public. Why? Because private prayer gives us an opportunity to pour our hearts out to God. To give Him our problems. To tell Him our hurts, our needs, and to pray for others. But it also gives us a time to confess to God that maybe we are worried. Maybe we are concerned. Maybe we are shaking in our faith a little bit. Things that maybe we don't want to admit to each other, to other Christians. When we go to God in private, we pray to Him, we can tell Him those things. We can confess those things to Him. And we can ask Him, God, help me not to worry. Help me look to learn to pray instead of worry. Or God, help me to instead focus on the circumstances, focus on Christ. We can pour out things to God that maybe we don't want to pour out to other people. And that also tells us and shows God that we're making our prayer life a priority. And when we make that prayer life a priority, God begins to work in ways that we can never dream of Him working. When we make our prayer life a priority, we begin to change in ways that we never thought that we could. We begin to see changes not just in our lives, but see changes in the lives of the people that we're praying for. Therefore, it's a must that we make our private prayer life a priority as we're seeking God's answers to our prayers. But God also wants us to pray in public. And He wants us to pray together. And in James 5, 14, He says, Is any one of you sick? He should go to the doctor. Right? Isn't that what it says? If any one of you sick, go to the doctor. No, He says He should call on the elders of the church and pray over Him. And anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. So we go back to James. He tells us that if someone in our church family is sick, they should just go to the doctor. No, he says they should call on the elders of the church to pray over them. James instructs us to use the spiritual leaders of our church to anoint a sick person with oil and pray. Now, anointing oil with oil is an Old Testament practice. 
where the oil represented the Spirit of God. And we should still do this today. I can stand here today and tell you that God has answered prayers for me recently where I've used oil to anoint. It's not the oil. It's not the prayers. It's God. But it's God answering those prayers because we obey what He tells us to do. Therefore, I believe that maybe we should do this a little more. When someone is sick and there's a dire need or there's a dire need in their family and their heart, we should call on the elders of our church. They should anoint the person who's sick or who's struggling with oil. More importantly, we should pray. Again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. How many times have we had a prayer circle right here? And God has answered those prayers. Why? Because we're being obedient to what He told us to do. He said, pray for each other. Get the elders of the church around them. Lay hands on them and pray for them. James says that those prayers are powerful and, expect, and, and, and effective because it's God's chosen spiritual leaders being obedient to His Word. Prayer is so powerful and effective when we are in obedience. And then Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. Do you remember how we talked about earlier that prayer is a weapon of spiritual warfare? It's a tool that we have, the most important tool that we have for each other, for ourselves. And when we pray, we should pray in the Spirit. Because no matter what we face, we can pray in the Spirit. Even when we can't find the words, we don't know what to ask for. The Holy Spirit will help us to pray. When the circumstances are so dark, the difficulties that we're facing is crushing. The Holy Spirit will help us to pray. When the pain is so deep in our lives that we can only say simple words like, help me, Lord, the Holy Spirit knows the need and helps us to pray. When we pray in the Spirit, on all occasions, our prayers will be heard. But there's also another important element of prayer. And that important element of prayer is faith. Not only do we need to pray, not only do we need to pray in the Spirit, but we got to believe that God can answer our prayers. Matthew chapter 21, verse 22 says, If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now this isn't a blank check. But this reminds us that we must believe that our prayers are already answered before we even pray. We may not see the answer when we want, but we must continue to believe that God hears and will answer our prayers. We must not doubt when we pray. You know, there's been a lot of prayers never answered because of the person that prayed it down. The person that prayed the prayer says, God, I really don't think you can handle this. Or maybe they thought that my problem is it's too small. It's not even important enough, but I'm going to pray over it, but God's not going to pay attention to this. Or maybe they've found themselves in a position where it's absolutely impossible and hopeless situation. So they, they don't even pray. Or if they do, it's just because everybody else is. And their prayers are answered because they didn't have the faith that God can answer the prayers. But when we don't doubt, when we truly believe, we will soon get an answer. And in Acts chapter 12, verses 6 through 16, we read the answer of Paul's situation. It says, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Paul was sleeping between two, two soldiers, bound with two chains, and since he stood guard at the entrance. He's in trouble, isn't he? He's not going anywhere. He's locked in prison and he's chained to soldiers. And then there's prison guards at each door. But in verse 7 it says, Suddenly an angel from the Lord appeared in light 
and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quickly, get up, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around him and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. Peter didn't even believe that what was going on was going on. Did he doubt? Probably not. He just thought he was dreaming. This was something that was virtually impossible, and here it was happening. So probably, Peter thought he was dreaming, but... And then in verse 10 it says, They passed through the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. And they went through it. When they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left them. And then Peter turned around and went back to prison. No, then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. So Peter, when he came, when he woke up, when he finally, I guess he, the angel poured a cup of coffee over his head, and he realized, now I know without a doubt, there's no doubt left in my mind that this was from God. Sometimes when we pray and we get an answer to our prayers, the only thing that we can say is there's no doubt in my mind that it was a God thing. That it had to have come from God, because it couldn't have come from any place else. But the story doesn't end there. We go to verse 12, it says, and when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Now listen to this. This is where the story gets funny. It says, Peter knocked on the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhonda came and answered the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overwhelmed, overjoyed, that she ran back without opening, without opening it and explained, Peter is at the door. She was so excited that God had answered her prayers that she didn't open the door and let Peter in. She was ecstatic. But the people upstairs, they replied, says, you're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be an angel. They didn't believe God could answer their prayers. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. Sometimes we have to keep on knocking on that door. Even after our prayer is answered to get people to believe us. Here we see an answer to prayer. The prayers of the church for Peter. This was a miraculous rescue. This is something that was absolutely impossible to be done by human hands. And it took Peter a few minutes to realize what had really happened. And that those that were praying for him, they weren't even looking for the answer when the answer came. And sometimes we do the same thing. We pray that God will open a door, and then when he opens it, we walk right on past, missing it completely. We pray, oh God, help our church to grow. God says, well, here, do this. And we just go right on, ignoring what he said. Oh God, give us an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. We go out to eat and there's a waitress standing right there having the worst day of her life. God's opened the door and we just walk all right on by. We pray God give us an opportunity in our community for our church to be the hands and feet of Christ. And God opens that door and we just walk on by. Those who were praying for Peter were not even looking for an answer. So when Peter showed up, the servant girl didn't even open the door. And those that were praying accused her of being crazy. And then when they finally opened the door, when they finally answered the knock, they were shocked that God could do such an impossible task. Again, this was a miracle. This was an answer to a prayer, an answer to the impossible. Many times we pray for the impossible. And when God answers, we, like those other believers, are shocked. 
almost like we doubted God's ability to answer. But this just goes to show us and remind us that God can do the impossible. God can change the unchangeable. When we talk about somebody being lost, oh, there's no way they're going to accept Christ. But prayer can change that person's heart to the point to where they accept Christ. God can soften the heart. God can calm the storm in your life. God can end the storm in your life. God can break the chains of anything that binds us. It doesn't matter whether it's doubt, worry, anxiety, sin, debt, troubles in life, family issues. If we bring it to Him and trust, that he can change it, God can do the impossible and change the unchangeable. If God can free Peter from prison, what chains can God remove from our lives even today? And then in John chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. Jesus says if we remain in Him and we remain obedient to Him, God is going to answer our prayers. Because obedience, again, is a powerful, powerful thing. And as long as we pray in the way that God's Word instructs us to pray, we're going to be a praying according to the will of God and our prayers are going to be answered. We are to pray for the sick. We are to pray instead of worry. We're going to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. We're to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other. We're to earnestly pray in private and in public. We're to call on the elders of the church to anoint the sick and to pray over them. We are to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. And we are to believe that God can and will answer our prayers. And that God can and will do the impossible and change the unchangeable. I know some of the things that we pray for seem like they're impossible. Some of the people that we pray for seem like they're unchangeable. But if we remain faithful in our prayers and in our prayer life, and we make our prayer, our prayer life our priority, God will do the impossible and change the unchangeable. Understand there is no need too small. There is no need too unimportant. There's no need too big. There's no need too possible, too impossible. There's no one that's so far lost. God can never find them or save them. There's nothing that's too impossible for God to handle. See, God uses difficult times in our life to build our character and grow our faith. God uses these difficult times in our life to help us to learn that practice makes perfect. And when we pray instead of worry, we're putting our faith in Him into practice, and it's only going to grow. So I ask you this morning, are you relying on God to answer your prayers? <clears throat> When we pray according to God's word, he will answer. When we pray according to God's will, he will answer. This morning, do you trust God enough to ask him to do the impossible and change the unchangeable? This morning, as we come to a time of invitation, I challenge you. Try him out. See if he's true to his word. If there's something in your life that seems impossible, or someone that you know that seems unchangeable, give it a shot. Pray for him. Pray for him like you've never prayed for him before. And don't expect the answer right away, but keep praying. Jesus said to ask, to seek, and to knock. 
And when it didn't work the first time, he said, ask again, seek again, and keep knocking until the door is open. So just because you don't see the answer today doesn't mean he's not going to answer. So continue to pray until God does the impossible and changes the unchangeable.